you know what, I'll say it like this. Making movies is a nightmare and every moment of it is extremely painful. And I don't know, like I'm talking about physical production, I don't know that there's one thing that is the hardest. Every day it's just torture and you're constantly making concessions and uh, sacrificing things. And, um, and uh, yeah, I couldn't pinpoint a single thing that was more painful than the rest. It was all, it was all awful. What advice do you have for young filmmakers just getting started? The, what, the only advice that, that I try to give young people is that you will not stand a chance unless you, your first feature is made in such a way that, that that story and you making it is going to be better than if somebody else had your story and a hundred million dollars. Um, because you need to find a way to have the context of what you're, or the context of your film inform the film itself yeah, in a way that, that only you could do. Otherwise, you will, you'll, you'll, you'll stand no chance. Or you'll, or you'll be at it for 40 years before you do anything worthwhile. I understand you did a lot of research into BlackBerry when writing the script for this. You got like lots of documentation and papers and things. Mm -hmm. um, what was something interesting that you found in there that maybe didn't make it into the movie? The people at BlackBerry had a potato cannon that they was made by a guy named Matthias Wandel and they would launch prototype blackberries out of it to test how strong they were like to see how um, like you know how rigid the frames of them were although maybe it was defective products that they launched out of that potato cannon um, but that was an original draft of the script that we took out oh, yeah um, what software did you guys use to edit the film? We always use Premiere. I think that it, uh, Adobe Premiere, at least for people who grew up using it, like there's no reason not to be using it. The, the team integration of it is so good. Like we use team projects. Sometimes it was crazy and slow as hell because of that team integration. Like they've got to figure out how to make that quicker. But um, if you're a young person trying to teach yourself how to edit, Hey, all nonlinear systems are basically the same, but I would encourage you to to get a student Adobe license and use that. It's 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 so great. It's so user friendly. But now it, 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 that um, Da Vinci is it Da Vinci Resolve now yeah. now they now they have a nonlinear editor which I have not used, so I can't. Maybe it's unbelievable, and I like that it's integrated with their grading software, um, especially since nowadays it seems like everybody's grading with Da Vinci, but. But I'll, I'm going to stay using Premiere until until I'm forced to stop. They up the monthly fees to like a thousand dollars a month. I don't think that they wouldn't do that. Their user base is too broad. Inflation. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, what other advice would you give to people trying to break into narrative filmmaking? Well, you know, I actually think that the term "breaking in" is apt because. You, it's not like there's a hierarchy you climb. It's not like you get promoted into being a filmmaker. You really need to just go out and do it on your own. And I may be like a Luddite in this way, but I think the film festivals is like the best way to get there. Like what I've noticed is that the filmmakers that I have paid attention to or who have appeared on the scene or who are doing interesting things are almost all recognized by film festivals first. And so focusing on making the absolute best possible film you can and then premiering it at a festival where it's going to mean something is, the, is a fast track for not just directors, but cinematographers, editors, producers. Like I say, like if you just make a movie that premieres at a major festival, congratulations, you are uh, whatever you did on that movie. You're now officially a cinematographer. Um, do you remember your first cell phone? Uh, yes. Was it Blackberry? No, no, I never owned a Blackberry. In fact, I never even really touched one before we started making this movie. I didn't, I knew nothing about them. My dad had them, but uh, yeah, I knew nothing. It felt very much like an adult thing too. Like I had a cell phone before the Blackberry and I remember getting an iPhone and just not in between. I was the exact same. Yeah. Well, I think, and the film gets into this, I think it's because Blackberry was actually not, 
a vision of a culture or a lifestyle. It was a product that served an immediate business problem. And ultimately, beyond all the other things that the film gets into, I think that that's what killed them. That they did not have a vision for the future in the way that the modern smartphone really did. Like a transformational vision where we're all using our smartphones as tools. And they, yeah, theirs was, theirs was still locked in a product. They were, they were hardware people. They were hardware people. One more? Yeah. What do you think about VR? Okay, a lot of people have tried to convert me to VR. And I still have not... Yeah, let me put it to you this way. A cell phone or a smartphone, you can put in your pocket and take it anywhere and the user experience is seamless with the rest of reality. Whereas VR is still in this place where you need to be in a specific spot. It completely changes your integration with the real world. And I, it's funny because by, the, 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 by its very definition, it has to be separated yeah. from the real world. And because of that, for me, I'm having trouble seeing it take off as like a daily, everybody's using it, everybody has it, people have their VR lenses with them. Maybe if it becomes so, if it becomes so unbelievably exciting that people have no choice but to change their life around it, then yeah, obviously it'll be a successful product, but it, for the, it's just not there for me yet. And I played a lot of VR games, <laughs> but they got to figure out the motion. They got to figure out how to make you move in a way that isn't just that uh, inertia-based jetpack yeah. movement, which is the only one that seems to uh, work. But again, I'm a total, I know nothing. And then you also got to worry about getting the red eye thing too. All of it. For too long. I know, and, they, and even the focus I have trouble getting with, but... You know, anything else. But, uh, yeah, maybe one day. I, my, uh, my editor, uh, Bobby, is a VR obsessive. Yeah. Obsessive, and he tries to get me into it, but... I do I, a lot of VR stuff too. I'm going to be my card. I uh, post like, YouTube, all VR. Oh, you know, yeah. Well, look, again, I, I, I hope that the technology winds up having the same type of, well, it, it deserves a day in the sun and not just uh, to be like another virtual boy. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about cell phone radiation? No, I, in fact, I know nothing about it. My friend Owen what, talked about cell phone radiation a lot because he's a school teacher. He's the guy from my first film, The Dirties. And he says, yeah, it's dangerous, it's dangerous, but I've never looked into it. Check out my documentary on YouTube. All right, and so you, and so you have some information on cell phone radiation. I interviewed the co-founder of Apple. He doesn't hold it next to his head, and yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, so he only, he <laughs> talks on Bluetooth headphones only? Um, he uses a speakerphone or a wired headset. All right, yeah. so even Bluetooth he's against. Yeah, I know. I'm going to check this documentary out. Yeah, it's called Mobile Labs. Yeah, okay. Nice All right. Nice meeting you too, man.